makes a masterpiece. Great pictures are complex things, and the pleasure they give us grows the more clearly we see how they were made and understand what the artists set out to achieve and what they achieved it with. At the end of the last program, we saw how the remarkable qualities of oil paint allow it to be applied in all kinds of different ways, to be handled, in fact, for its own sake, almost for the sheer pleasure of handling from nearly transparent paint thinly applied to thick and creamy dabs of white, the artist can confidently play on a wide range of different textures. The full possibilities of this aspect of oil paint were first and perhaps incomparably realized in 16th century Venice and above all by Titian. Even a picture as intimate as this little mother and child shows how Titian delights in paint as paint, using it not so much to describe form as to animate our perception of it. It was probably painted in the 1570s, when Titian was already over 80 years old, and it shows the extraordinary freedom of his late works. In the white cuff of the mother, in the fringe of her shawl, the paint becomes a kind of handwriting, almost independent of the shape below. Indeed, it is almost literally handwriting, because it's quite likely that in some of these areas, Titian applied the paint with his fingers. As Titian's contemporaries observed, we are compelled to step back to make the underlying forms appear convincing and solid. It is the paint that controls the viewer. With Titian, as never before, the brush stroke becomes gesture. And with him starts a tradition in Western art of free, loose painting that runs all the way to the Impressionists and beyond. It is that tradition of handling paint, from Titian to Van Gogh and Monet, that we're going to be looking at in this program. It's scarcely an exaggeration to say that the whole of Europe thrilled to Titian's revolutionary use of his paint, but nowhere more so than Spain. The royal collection in Madrid quickly acquired many of his finest works, and it was there, at the beginning of the 17th century, that they were admired and closely studied by both Rubens and Velasquez. Just how much the young Velasquez learnt from looking at Titian, we can see from his portrait of Philip IV, painted in the 1630s. The king stands as though waiting at a great distance to receive us in audience. Even from far away, his face is instantly legible and recognizable, but his costume is unusually splendid, not the somber black that Spanish monarchs normally wore, but a rich brown shimmering with silver embroidery. In a real audience, we would have been hurried forward to the king, he is not a remote monarch, for he is standing only at eye level to receive us. But as we get nearer the portrait, the way we see him changes. The king's head, more tightly painted than the rest, remains always the same. Whatever our position, he remains what a king must remain, recognizable and immutable. But once we reach the painting, the wonderful silver embroidery of his costume begins to disintegrate into what has been described as a fricassee of paint. The different surface strokes seem to float free of the form below, dissolving into broad dabs of white, gray, and black. At this distance, we're conscious not so much of the king as of the exuberant, bewildering paint. The agitated surface and the bold strokes 
create a powerful optical effect. A tighter painting of the face suggests we move closer. The looser handling of the costume demands we stand back. We are, to all intents and purposes, dazzled. But by what? We move in and out, admiring now the monarch, now the painter. And the name of the man who has wrought this miracle, who has brought us close to the king and then kept us from him, is written in the opening words of the petition that Philip holds in his hand. Diego Velasquez, painter to your majesty. The paper makes plain what is going on. This virtuoso performance is not art for art's sake, nor is the purpose the glorification of the artist. This is great painting, humbly laid, like the petition itself, at the service of the king's majesty. In the midst of this unprecedented turmoil of paint, Philip IV, in his silver suit and golden chain, remains quietly impassive. But not far away in the gallery hangs another king, also richly clad and wearing a gold chain. But Rembrandt's Belshazzar, which also exploits the unique gestural power of oil paint, was made not to glorify a monarch, but to demonstrate the terrifying power of God. At a huge feast given for his courtiers and concubines, Belshazzar, the idolatrous king of Babylon, uses the gold goblets looted from the temple of God at Jerusalem. Suddenly, the fingers of a man's hand appear and trace in Hebrew script the fatal words, many, many, tekel upharsin, foretelling the imminent death of the king. As the writing appears on the wall, the Old Testament tells us that the king's countenance was changed and his knees smote one against another. He rises in terror, his gold chain swinging, as he knocks over the goblet behind him. But his shock is conveyed not only by expression and gesture. Rembrandt uses the very surface of the paint to suggest the panic in Belshazzar's breast. It is as if the paint itself was overwrought, tormented and distressed, to suggest at once opulence and horror. As we look more closely at the golden incrustations on the king's cloak, they become themselves a metaphor of violence. How does Rembrandt do it? We've investigated this picture very thoroughly in the conservation and scientific departments, and as a result, we actually know a lot about how it was painted. It's on canvas, and this is the sort of canvas that Rembrandt would have used. It's hand-woven, and so you can see the uneven weave and these raised threads here. In common with most 17th century painters, Rembrandt worked on a colored ground. This is applied in two layers, what we call a double ground. The first is a warm reddish brown, this is red earth, and then over it is a warm brownish gray. This is the color that Belshazzar's feast was painted on and I'm now going to demonstrate on a canvas prepared in this way. The area I'm going to be mimicking is from Belshazzar's cloak. During our examination of the picture we took a tiny sample of paint from this area and you can see the first two layers of ground the red and the grey. On the top is a thick layer of yellow, which is the colour you see on the surface. But beneath that, there are layers of brown and black paint, which appear in all the paint samples, and they seem to be modelled to some extent, and this suggests that it's present over the whole canvas, and that it is indeed what we call a dead colouring, that is, an undermodelling in neutral colours. It's unusually dark for Rembrandt, but we think he must have chosen it to give a kind of gloomy, nocturnal tint across the whole picture, which of course adds wonderfully to the drama. The 
scientific and technical examination can teach us a lot about how paintings are made, but we also learn from just actually handling the materials that the artist used. You develop this understanding of how paints could be manipulated and so on. The colours for each day's painting had to be prepared by grinding them in linseed oil. And you can't store them for long, so the painter had to be well organised and plan in advance which pigments he was going to use. When paints are ground by hand, they all have slightly different textures because they absorb different amounts of oils and therefore that gives each pigment a slightly different consistency. And you rarely notice this when you're brushing out the colours. Lead to yellow, for example, which of course Rembrandt makes a great deal of use of in Belshazzar's Feast, has this lovely soft buttery consistency. And he makes great use of this when he's painting in impasto, that is when he's using thick raised paint, which in Rembrandt's case isn't sort of stiff and peaky, it's soft and almost has rounded edges. He doesn't always wait for his paint layers to dry. He often works his colours into one another while they're still wet. This is what we call wet in wet painting. What I think becomes clear from all this is just how unspontaneous this kind of painting has to be with such a long and careful process of preparation of both paint and paint layers it's only right at the surface that the artist can actually let rip. Belshazzar's cloak and clasp are boldly, almost crudely painted. Rembrandt worries at his paint, even sometimes scratching into it with the end of his brush. It is the uninhibited climax to a long and controlled workshop process. But in the 19th century, when prepared canvases and machine-made pigments could be bought over the counter, the artist can almost begin with the expressive gesture. The two Dutchmen, Rembrandt and Van Gogh, are apparently doing much the same thing, working up the yellows. But in the Van Gogh, the paint looks different. For one thing, much of it stands proud of the canvas, so that the sunflowers not only appear three-dimensional, they are three-dimensional. Van Gogh has used a far stiffer paint than Rembrandt, and he has used it in far greater quantities. To be precise, he has used not a paint laboriously ground by traditional methods in the workshop, but a 19th century paint manufactured by a color merchant and sold ready-made in a tube. These new paints change the artist's craft forever. No longer did he need the support of a workshop to prepare his materials, nor did he need to plan carefully in advance how much paint he would need and when. Paint in a tube is always available and always fresh. For the first time, thanks to paint in a tube, the artist could be a one-man band, or, if you prefer, an isolated genius, working alone, spontaneously, and above all, fast. The new paints brought self-sufficiency and speed, but they were also much easier to put onto the canvas. Unlike the old hand-ground paints, all the colors now flowed from the brush with equal ease. So that when Van Gogh turned to another traditional Dutch preoccupation, landscape, he was able to evoke the gusting winds of Provence with rhythmic, undulating strokes that ripple through all the colors and across the whole canvas. Van Gogh could set off to paint in the south of France only because he could have canvases and paints sent to him anywhere. It is now customary to see many of his Provencal paintings as evidence of the artist's inner torment. But in truth, they are perhaps even stronger evidence of a flourishing paint industry and an efficient postal service. Van Gogh's many letters 
ordering canvas and paints show yet another crucial innovation. Advances in chemistry had revolutionized the range of colors, particularly bright colors, available to artists. No artist in an earlier century could even dream of sitting in the sun and asking his colorman to dispatch, as Van Gogh does in one of his letters, 18 tubes of different shades of chrome yellow. One of the most important pigments, in fact, were the chrome yellows. And these were prepared from a lead salt, and this is lead nitrate, and a chromium salt, and this is potassium chromate. And it's a very, very simple pigment to make, because all you do, in fact, is you prepare solutions of the two chemicals that you're going to use. This is the lead nitrate. If you then pour this into the solution containing the chromium salt, down comes the pigment, which is essentially chrome yellow. Now, if I were to do this in a concentrated solution, or if I was going to do it hot, or if I was going to slightly alter the acidity or the alkalinity, I could get an orange chrome. I could almost get a red chrome. Or if I was to use not lead chromate but a different salt, I could get a slightly more acid yellow. I can do all kinds of things. Uh, you can see this is actually flocculating quite nicely down there. Now, what it actually happens after this, this all settles out. And um, this is only a tiny one, I'm afraid, but when it settles out, It'll look like that. You find it in every 19th century painting, probably. You find it in the works by Monet, by Manet, by Renoir, uh, by Van Gogh, of course. Um, there's several different chrome yellows in, in paintings like the sunflowers. Uh, and in fact, it went on being used um, right up until very recent times. It wasn't only chromes that came from the modern chemist. There were also new blues and ready-mixed greens, viridian and emerald green, for example, which could be combined with the chromes in endless variations. In his long grass with butterflies, Van Gogh uses brilliant and stable greens that a 17th century artist would have killed for. I'm sure he used his paint without adding any turpentine or anything to thin it. And he just sort of gets a great clump on the brush, but then applies it with quite a deliberate stroke. Because if you press too hard, it of course just flattens. And he's trying to keep these raised brush strokes so that every single blade is a single stroke in a sense. Um, often with more than one color on it, but that's because the paint streaks as you're painting it on rather than him painting, first of all, a stripe of dark green and then putting a stripe of yellow next to it. If you don't go at it with, you know, your brush absolutely clotted, you just make a, um, you sort of push off the other paint. I think he worked in quite a deliberate way, actually, rather than in the sort of frenzy, which I think is the public imagination of Van Gogh. And he actually had to be very careful to make these marks without pushing the paint around and without squashing the impasto that he's trying to create. It's extraordinary how, when you start to put this white in, that in some strange way, the clumps of grasses suddenly seem to become very three-dimensional. He seems to have painted the wings of the butterfly first as marks of lead white paint. And then he takes the dark blue, which I presume is ultramarine, and just with the point of a brush, so that it makes a wet in wet mark into the paint, outlines them and puts on a head. And then he just runs down the back and disturbs this paint.
In the summer of 1869, Monet took advantage of the new train service to set off on a day trip from Paris to the raffish bathing resort of La Grenouillère on an island in the Seine. He took with him a ready-made canvas of standard size and a large, almost random selection of manufactured paints in tubes, perhaps not quite certain of what his requirements would be when he was working out of doors. When he got there, he laid out on his palette a huge range of colors, at least 15, and began to work rapidly to catch the fleeting effects of the rippling waves, the moving boats, bobbing bathers, and the sunlight through the trees. I think Monet's constantly looking at the water that he's painting and then making a stroke. Sometimes, of course, he is working the paint a bit in advance, but I think it's quite long and slow and deliberate to make these marks. We have to imagine him looking up, trying to capture that effect of light on the water, which of course is so incredibly transient that it changes every time he looks. He already used up all his white paint. Get some more. with a profligacy that is startling in an artist who was always bitterly complaining about being short of money, Monet muddled his bright colors in order to produce muted ones. The bluish greens, khakis, and olive tones of the boats in the foreground, for example, or the grayish roof of the small hut in the distance. Here and there, Strokes and touches of pure bright color were applied just as they had come straight from the tube, like the bright red vermilion that forms the flowers at the left. Even more striking than the colors is the way they are applied, for Monet had also taken with him to La Grenouillère some 19th century brushes made with flat metal ferrules rather than the traditional round brushes. These new brushes allow a completely different kind of stroke, broad, flat, and evenly loaded. The artist can lay the paint on rapidly in thickly dabbed clusters or broken horizontal slabs. It is the Impressionist brush stroke. Where Van Gogh varies his stroke to replicate the rhythms of living forms, Monet uses his to recreate an optical sensation. The dazzle of sunlight as it bounces off the water and consumes the contours of the little figures on the wooden walkway. This is painting not to represent what we know to be there, but to mimic how we all actually see under such circumstances. Only the boats in the foreground are in any sort of conventional focus. Everything else is as it would be if we were peering into such sunshine, to a greater or lesser degree dissolved by light. It was this ambition to capture the visual sensation of the moment that led Monet, eight years later, to set up his easel in the Paris train station from which he'd set off for La Grenouillère, the Gare Saint-Lazare. It was a subject that he was to paint 12 times within a few months. Once again, he took with him a selection of pigments in tubes, and once again, he used ready-made canvases. On the back of this one, you can still see the stamps of the canvas supplier and the stretcher maker. Monet showed eight of his Gare Saint-Lazare pictures together at an exhibition in 1877. And it was perhaps this that gave him the idea for a quite new kind of painting, a series of canvases showing the same subject at different times of day 
and different times of year. Making a series like this was not without its problems. To paint the group of poplars near his home, Monet ultimately had to buy the trees to prevent them being felled for timber before he'd finished recording their appearance through the changing seasons. He usually began by painting a study out of doors, like this one, which indeed hardly appears to have got any further. You can recognize the broad stroke of the modern brush that we saw in La Grenouillere, and the rapid touch as he hurried to catch the clouds. These quick notations of the things seen were then worked up in the studio until the entire series formed one harmonious whole. Indeed, one single work of art extending through time. As more and more work was done in the studio, we see a fascinating change in the way that Monet handled his paint, especially in the great series of the water lilies in his garden at Giverny, which he was working on at the end of his life when he was in his 70s and 80s. Monet was now working above all from memory. A huge canvas like this could obviously never have been set up out of doors. The technique he had evolved years before to catch a fleeting sensation now becomes a means of reflecting on that sensation. We see the artist taking pleasure not just in his subject, but in the very gesture with which he applies the paint. The lily pads float on the pond, but as we get closer, the paint marks appear to float on the picture surface. It is, in essence, the same phenomenon that we saw at the beginning of the program in the late work of Titian. Both artists in their old age become fascinated by the dual capacity of oil paint to create an illusion of external reality while allowing a parallel private world of the free-ranging brush stroke. Monet the Impressionist, like Velasquez and Rembrandt before him, is part of the Titian oil paint tradition. So far in these programs, we have been looking at how the pictures in the National Gallery were made by artists working on wood or canvas using pigments ground from semi-precious stones excreted by insects or invented by chemists, which were then bound in egg yolk or a vegetable oil. In short, we've been looking at pictures as complex physical objects made in complicated ways.
But once the picture has left the artist's studio, its career as an object has only just begun. Like a castaway's message thrown to the waves, the artist's message to the future will be received only if it survives in legible form. And a picture's journey through time can be every bit as perilous as that of a bottle through the sea. The huge canvas that you see in front of me was stored for many years in an alpine castle where there was no room for it to stand upright. To be shown to prospective buyers in the 1950s, it had to be taken out of doors where in the high mountain winds, it promptly blew away, landed on a stake and got torn. Fortunately, the damage done was easily repaired and it is now invisible. But some pictures suffer from far greater violence. These large battle scenes were painted for Louis-Philippe, Duke of Orleans, in Paris in the 1820s, as part of his campaign, ultimately successful, to become the next king of France. When, later, he was dislodged by the revolution of 1848, they were savagely bayoneted as they hung in his palace. Although the artist, Horace Vernet, was on hand to patch them up, the scars can still be seen when the light catches them at the right angle. It is our job here in the National Gallery to repair and to preserve what we can of the artist's intentions, to retrieve as best we may the message of their masterpieces. This can be a very complex task indeed, as it was with Chima's great altarpiece that shows St. Thomas doubting Christ's resurrection. The altarpiece was painted around 1500 in Venice for a church nearby, and it remained there for 300 years. Then, in the early 19th century, it was brought back to Venice to be restored. There, it was left in a cellar which was flooded by the Grand Canal at high tide, which, as you may imagine, did the picture no good at all. By the time it reached the National Gallery, it was in a pretty poor state, and in the 1970s, it was clear that the gallery's conservation department was going to have to intervene. The picture, although very dirty, had most of its original paint remaining, apart from one or two significant areas of loss, mainly in the clothing, and a good deal of flaking. To stop further flaking, the picture had for years been covered in large sheets of thin tissue paper stuck onto the surface. Cleaning involved removing both surface dirt and a layer of discolored varnish with cotton wool to reveal the true color of the original paint beneath, in this case, the head of St. Peter. But the picture had been through so much that the treatment to stop the flaking of the paint proved inadequate. Had the picture been stood upright, large areas of paint would simply have fallen off. So the gallery decided that if it was ever to be shown again, the whole paint layer would need to be detached from its wooden panel and then securely reattached to a new, more rigid support. This involved chiseling away the poplar planks down to the white gesso on which the picture was painted. This fragile layer of gesso and paint was then reattached to a lightweight aluminium and fiberglass panel. After the transfer was complete, the many holes in the surface of the picture could be restored. And finally, in the mid-1980s, after more than 15 years of work, it was put back on display. From a distance, there is now little sign of what Chima's altarpiece has been through. But other pictures wear their scars of battle much more visibly, and none more so than Manet's execution of Maximilian. The picture shows the execution of the Emperor Maximilian of Mexico, except that it doesn't, because all we see of Maximilian is his left arm. The story was one of the great political scandals of the mid-19th century. In 1867, the French government abandoned the foreign prince that they had placed on the Mexican throne, the Archduke Maximilian of Austria, 
a cousin by marriage of Queen Victoria, and left him to be shot by a nationalist Mexican firing squad. The incident caused a sensation, and images of the dead Maximilian, some of them particularly gruesome, circulated widely in both Europe and America to the great embarrassment of the French authorities. Like many of his contemporaries, Manet was appalled by the way his government had behaved, and he decided to paint the scene of the execution. As he worked, and as more information reached Europe, his ideas changed, and he painted three full-size versions, of which this is the second one. The third and final version, which is now in Mannheim in Germany, shows what the fragmentary London picture must once have shown. Maximilian calmly faces his death, flanked by the two Mexican generals who had remained loyal to him after his defeat by the nationalist forces. It was politically out of the question to exhibit any of these pictures in France. And so this version was rolled and stored. The canvas rotted, and eventually Manet's family cut out the pieces in good condition and sold them. The four pieces were bought by the artist Edgar Degas, who greatly admired Manet, and who assembled them pretty well as you see them now. What a picture it must once have been, and what a picture, in fact, it still is. The sword that we see raised in the middle of the picture shows that the order to shoot has just been given and executed. On the right, the non-commissioned officer prepares his musket to deliver the coup de grace and finish the victims off should the firing squad not kill them outright. The soldiers in the squad itself are shown faceless, carrying out their joint task, agents of a higher authority, in no sense themselves principles. As the one victim we can see prepares to die, he loyally clasps the hand of the emperor. They are hands that say more than any facial expression could, the more poignant for being fragmentary. Showing the death of a noble victim, the picture has itself become a noble victim and has, through its mutilation, acquired a new power, one certainly not intended by the artist, but perhaps not inappropriate to what he was trying to say. You can see at once that Manet's Maximilian is a picture in pieces, but there is one work in the gallery which few visitors would now guess was once also in fragments. Here, the reason was nothing to do with politics, but with a much older human failing, greed. In the altarpiece painted in the 1450s by Pesolino and Filippo Lippi, four saints stand in the Tuscan countryside, adoring the Holy Trinity. God the Father, holding the crucified Christ, with between them the dove of the Holy Spirit. The small panels in the predella below each carry a scene relating to the figure directly above. St. Mammoth, for example, is shown imprisoned with the lions who were intended to devour him, but instead licked him gently. Above, he is seen in glory with the other saints. It looks, in short, like a totally ordinary Italian altarpiece. And only the discolored panel in the bottom right-hand corner suggests that something is amiss. Yet the history of this picture is one of the most extraordinary in the National Gallery. At the end of the 18th century, it was taken from its church and hacked into readily saleable bits. By the middle of the 19th century, these were widely dispersed in different hands and it took nearly a hundred years to reassemble the bits you now see in the National Gallery. The first piece to come to the gallery was the diamond-shaped cutout of the Trinity itself, bought in 1863. 
Over 50 years later, the gallery was given the right-hand angel and then bought the angel on the left. The saints on the left-hand side were given by Queen Victoria to Prince Albert as his birthday present in 1846 and were lent to the gallery by King George V in 1919. The right-hand saints belonged to his cousin, the German Emperor Kaiser Wilhelm II, until the 1920s. In 1937, the four panels in the predella were given by a couple from New York. But it was puzzling that while every saint in the picture had below him a story relating to his life on earth, the central group of the Trinity did not. The original frame, however, would have left space for a fifth central panel, and in 1995, our curator at last ran it to earth, the little picture of St. Augustine pondering the Trinity in the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. We borrowed it for a short exhibition, and for a brief moment, the jigsaw was complete. But not quite. If you look at the bottom right-hand corner, you can see that the inset square is a modern reconstruction. The original panel with the drapery and the feet is still missing. So if anybody watching this program knows where it is, we should be very grateful to hear about it. Pesolino's Trinity is almost a unique case. It's very rare to be able to reassemble so accurately and so completely all the dispersed parts of an altarpiece. Right at the other end of that spectrum is this panel, painted by the South German artist Wolf Huber, probably a little before 1520. It shows the legendary scene not recounted in the Gospels, where Christ came to take leave of his mother before setting off for Jerusalem, crucifixion, and death. As we see it now, it's quite clear that a considerable part of even this scene must be missing. On the right-hand side, we see only the hands of Christ as he blesses his mother, a part of his robe, and his toes. The altarpiece must, at some stage, have been brutally dismembered. And this panel was certainly very roughly handled, because when it came to the gallery, it looked like this. The panel had originally been painted on five fir wood planks. At some time in the past, these planks had come apart, and they had been put back together rather inexpertly, making certain details look very odd. As we cleaned the picture, removing the work of the previous restorer, it became apparent that the planks had not only been misaligned, but had been planed down to make a neater join, losing several millimetres of paint. The left eye of this holy woman in particular was not only badly damaged, but you can see very clearly as you follow the contour of her headdress that the planks don't line up. The conservator in charge of the picture made an outline of the painting on tracing paper, cut it into strips to match the planks, and realigned them in order to work out the contours exactly. Looking at Christ's hand, it became obvious that a fairly large new piece of wood would have to be inserted in order to make the hand read coherently once again. In fact, two other pieces of wood had to be inserted as well, all three were made of well-seasoned pine. All the panel joins needed to be glued again. A clamping table was used for this, which allows the conservator access to joins from every angle. The last and largest section to be glued was the wide insert running through Christ's outstretched hand. A thin priming was applied to the new wood leaving the grain of the pine clearly visible so that it matched the texture of Huber's original panels. Tiny losses and the smaller wood inserts were then painted to match the original. As always, retouching was restricted to areas of damage and was carried out using stable and easily removable acrylic paints. The trickiest piece of reconstruction was left until the last and was built up in several layers. 
with the retouching and the readjustment of the planks complete, the picture became much more coherent and, we think, much closer to what Huber had originally achieved. When we look at the picture on the wall now, although there are some very beautiful passages, the grieving women, the windswept figure hurrying across the footbridge, and the gloomy forest, this is obviously very far from being a complete recovery. The amputated figure on the right is very disturbing. And we show the picture as a fragment, explaining on the label that the inserted strips have been painted by the restorer and not by Huber himself. It is emphatically not how Huber intended us to see it. But given everything that this picture has been through, I think it is now as close as we can get to his intentions. And it offers us a glimpse, if only a glimpse, of what must once have been a very great achievement. With this picture, with Manny's Maximilian and with Pesolino's Trinity, we've been looking at damage to the structure of paintings. But even when the structure remains intact, the paint on the surface can change in very disconcerting ways, and often in ways that we can do nothing about. The inside panels of the Wilton diptych are almost perfectly preserved. But things are not, in fact, quite what they seem. Edward the Confessor, the central standing figure in the left-hand panel, wears a dull off-white robe. Yet the folds are painted with a dark brown red. On very close examination, we can see traces of red in both the inner and the outer robe. What has happened is that the robe was once a much warmer pink, possibly made with a lake pigment derived from the excreta of insects, and one notoriously prone to fading when exposed to light. And that is what must have happened here. The artist meant us to see Edward the Confessor between the green and blue of King Edmund and the gold and orange of the kneeling Richard II, not in today's dull white, but in a dashing shade of pink. The original paint is still there, but it no longer looks as the artist intended it to. Pigments that fade like this can give some very strange results. In 17th century Holland, for example, greens were very often made by mixing a blue with a yellow plant-based pigment. Now, these yellows are very vulnerable to light. And if they later fade to white, as they often do, the greens are left looking pale blue. This explains why, in Peter de Hoogh's Delft Courtyard, painted in 1658, the plants at the bottom right now look silvery blue and not the green that de Hoogh actually painted. The same problem affects many Dutch still lives, like Van Huysum's large flower piece. Every detail was so closely and naturalistically observed that the artist waited for the different flowers to come into season and ultimately had to date it both 1736 and 1737. So we are all the more disconcerted to find leaves of strong, sometimes almost brilliant, blue. The yellow pigment, which must originally have been mixed with the blue to make it green, has faded. You could, of course, make a good, vivid green by using copper, which quickly turns green if exposed to water or acid, as Veronese did in his allegory of the trials of love, which shows a particularly disagreeable incident with a male lover being beaten up by Cupid, apparently as a punishment for lust. But here, the copper greens have proved to be just as capricious as love itself. In the dress of the woman on the far left, there is a swathe of brilliant green derived from a copper base. The same pigment was used in the foliage above, but there, it has turned a dull brown. The summer leaves have thus become autumnal, but only long after the picture left the artist's studio. It's hard to know how Veronese himself would now react to this picture. The sky was painted in smalt, 
a pigment connected with the Venetian glass industry, and was once bright blue. For reasons no one fully understands, it has turned the dull gray we now see. But color change is not always left to chance. It can sometimes be made to happen, especially if it's going to help a picture to sell. And we think that's what must have happened with this picture, which the gallery bought in 1990. It's a portrait by an anonymous South German artist and was probably made in the 1470s. The letter that the sitter is holding and his signet ring identify him as Alexander Mornauer, town clerk of Landshut in Bavaria. And there's something about the tightly painted fingers and the expensive fur suggests this is a man who's collected a few taxes in his time. The quality of the painting was very high and it was clearly something the gallery wanted to acquire. But we were also interested in the blue background. Later German portraits of the early 16th century use this kind of background often, like, for instance, Holbein's portrait of the young princess of Denmark, who was briefly considered as a bride for Henry VIII and luckily rejected. We thought it would be good to show an earlier example of this kind of blue in the collection. And it would have been until the scientific department took a small sample of paint from a damaged area of the blue background. When they looked at it under the microscope, we all got something of a shock because it became clear that the whole of the blue background was painted in Prussian blue, a pigment that was not invented until the early 18th century, well over 200 years after the portrait had been finished. As conservators cleaned the picture and removed the later blue paint, we discovered a picture that was really in very good condition on the whole and with a very fine pink background. What emerged was Alexander Mornauer wearing a much taller hat which cast a beautifully observed shadow on the background and another shadow cast as though by the left-hand frame. We also discovered that at the end of the 18th century, the picture had been presented in England as a portrait by Holbein, which presumably explains the choice of the blue background, and a portrait of none other than Martin Luther. And the hat has, of course, been changed to the sort of shape that Martin Luther might have worn. The changes of color and of hat were clearly part of a strategy, an entirely successful strategy, to make the portrait more saleable, more appealing to the British market. And if now, instead of Martin Luther, we have a little-known local government official, we nonetheless can see once again, for the first time in nearly two centuries, what the anonymous and very skilled artist intended us to see. Though the blue may no longer interestingly remind us of Holbein's princess, the pink, no less fascinatingly, suggests comparisons with another picture in the collection and one that hangs just a few feet away, the portrait of Dürer's father. By far the most common of all causes of color change is what was actually put on to protect the pictures, varnish. But all varnishes discolor with time, especially in smoky atmospheres. And after a few decades, traditional varnishes usually spread a golden film over the whole picture. This is Holbein's portrait of the two French ambassadors who were in London in 1533 for the wedding of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. Before its recent cleaning, it showed to perfection the dulling, distorting effect of a hundred-year-old varnish on a paint surface whose colors had remained remarkably true. Whites obviously had become yellow, and reds and greens had become duller, while blues began to look green, a profound and uneven change in the color balance that the artist had intended. The varnish, probably put on around 1890, could be confidently distinguished from Holbein's harder original paint, and could be safely and easily removed by the restorer. 
As it was removed, we began to see again details which had become completely invisible. Holbein's signature and the date 1533. The floor and the feet of Jean de Dinteville, the left-hand ambassador. His sumptuous costume and the celestial globe behind. The instruments on the lower shelf of the table between the two men and Dantaville's intricately wrought dagger. All these had been lost in the golden mist of the dirty and discoloured varnish. In the few areas where there was substantial paint loss, either old restorations were left, for instance the medallion of St. Michael overcoming the devil, where there is virtually no original paint remaining, or else the missing areas were reconstructed as in the damaged nose of the distorted skull, which, viewed from the correct angle, now reads convincingly once again. Because Holbein is such a supreme master of his materials, the great majority of the paint surface is in excellent condition, the colors still very largely true. We can be fairly confident but what we are looking at is what Holbein wanted us to see. Over 450 years after he painted his masterpiece, the artist still addresses us directly. And that is the prime task of all the great picture galleries, to allow the artists to speak with their own voice. They can do so only through the materials they used. And as we've seen in these programs, those materials will often be subject to change and to damage. Our job is to slow the rate of that change and to minimize the impact of the damage, to enable the artists to speak as powerfully and as authentically as their materials will now allow to the millions of people who come to look at the pictures every year.